Thank you for joining us today at Synthesis Workshop. I'm your host, Reem, and for today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Liam Franov. Liam began his journey in chemistry at the University of Adelaide under the supervision of Associate Professor Jonathan George, where he completed the bio-inspired total synthesis of four natural products. He is now a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne in the Polyzotes Lab, where his research centers on organic electrosynthesis. Specifically, he investigates electro-induced reductive and derivative alkene aldehyde coupling, a topic he'll delve into in today's episode. And with that, I'll hand it over to Liam. Welcome, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be given this opportunity to present the recently published work from my doctoral research in the Polyzos group at the University of Melbourne. Alkenes and aldehydes are fundamental building blocks in organic synthesis. They're abundant, structurally diverse, widely accessible, and their reductive coupling gives rise to a whole range of sp3-rich oxygenated scaffolds from sp2 progenitors that are then primed for diversification. Now, a really underutilized way of forging a CC bond between these two fragments is to use the alkene as a nucleophile. This is all well and good for activated alkenes such as enolates or silyl enol ethers, but for less activated or unactivated alkenes such as styrenes or alpha olefins, the pi bond just isn't nucleophilic enough on its own. And this is really exemplified by the archetypal print reaction, which is a staple in natural product synthesis and the perfume industry, where in intermolecular cases, not even forcing or corrosive conditions could get a less activated alkene to add into an alkyl aldehyde. Now, one way to modulate the reactivity of these alkenes is to employ metal hydride chemistry, where we could generate an organometallic intermediate. But a more recent approach which has garnered considerable attention is where the aldehyde electrophile is turned into a nucleophile through single electron reduction. Now, this approach is a little tricky, though, because ketal radicals are inherently unstable. They're prone to dimerization, hydrolysis, oxidative decomposition, not to mention the radical felicity between these two species needs to be matched, which limits compatibility with electron-rich alkenes. On the other hand, our group has become really interested recently in the alternative to this approach, where instead the alkene component is reduced to its corresponding radical anion. And as it turns out, these intermediates generated from single electron reduction of less activated alkenes are super reactive. They're highly nucleophilic and highly basic, and our group has had some great success recently in harnessing the latent nucleophilicity of alkenes through their radical anion counterparts using multi-photon photoredox catalysis. But nonetheless, accessing the deep reduction potentials of less activated electron-rich alkenes still remains an ongoing challenge in organic synthesis. And so we imagined that electrosynthesis may provide an ideal platform to achieve these reduction potentials. The great thing about electrochemistry is that the user defines the cell potential. And so this level of precision allows for an unmatched level of chemoselectivity. Now this proof of concept had already been demonstrated in the late 70s by Schaefer and colleagues who showed that these reactive radical anion intermediates generated from styrene were sufficiently nucleophilic to react even with weakly electrophilic solvents like DMF or acetonitrile. But the super harsh electrochemical conditions at the time gave rise to numerous side reactions, indiscriminate regioselectivity, uncontrollable double additions, and even dimerization. And we figured that this kind of promiscuous reactivity of these intermediates was due to the very fundamental nature of the direct current waveform, the heartbeat of these reactions. DC incessantly delivers electrons to the cathode. And if you're applying really deep reduction potentials to reduce these recalcitrant substrates and your mass transfer is slow, this could give rise to overreduction of the substrate to a dianion species. Now, obviously, this dianion has just been drawn suggestively here. It wouldn't actually exist as a 1,2 dianion. But in reality, two electron reductions of these substrates is absolutely possible and was what we believed to be the source of unwanted reactivity. So we questioned if we could change the fundamental nature of that waveform into a different one called rapid alternating polarity. This is a square waveform where the electrodes rapidly oscillate between their roles as cathode and anode on a millisecond timescale. This back and forth switching means those deep reduction potentials could be accessed, but only for a fraction of a second. 
So theoretically, this only permits the reactions whose kinetics surpass that switching frequency. In context, we hypothesized that we could electrogenerate the alkene radical anion without overreducing it to the dianion. Not only would that circumvent all the other side reactions that would tend to plague this kind of approach, but it would afford a transient window of opportunity to capture that radical anion with an alkyl aldehyde to afford these secondary alcohols. And we imagined that this concept could even be extended to the C2C3 pi system within heterocyclic feedstocks such as benzofurans or benzothiophenes. And in doing so, this would de-aromatize the ring system and transform readily available planar sp2 frameworks into complex, biologically relevant sp3-rich architectures. In the same way with less activated alkenes, this kind of electroreduction strategy would harness the latent nuclear felicity of those C2-C3 pi bonds, and we postulated that by leveraging benzylic radical stability at C3, this might induce a regioselective preference solely at C2, and this kind of reactivity pattern is contrary to the classical regioselectivity often observed for benzofurans and benzothiophenes. So this whole strategy using rapid alternating polarity worked beautifully, and I'd like to provide a breakdown of our optimized conditions for this reaction. So, we used the shortest possible polarity switch duration in order to mitigate overreduction, and this ranged anywhere from 40 to 120 milliseconds depending on the substrate. We utilized a really greasy tetrahexyl ammonium salt as the electrolyte, which we thought would serve two purposes. One is that it might repel water from accessing the electrode surface, which we thought would prevent its reduction and also suppress protonation of the radical anion that forms in the vicinity of the cathode. Secondly, the steric bulk of the alkyl chains might weaken the ion pairing interactions between itself and the radical anion, which would facilitate coupling. We discovered that three equivalents of alkyl aldehyde were necessary to achieve maximum yields for coupling, and for the anodic processes, we discovered an unusual dependency on the presence of both bromide as the counter anion from the electrolyte and exogenous triphenylphosphine added to the reaction mixture. Now, while both of these components can oxidize at similar oxidation potentials to provide the source of electrons, we did speculate that there may be a synergistic oxidative relay process between these two components in order to efficiently drive out triphenylphosphine oxide as a byproduct. These reactions were conducted at constant current, so the rate of reaction was consistent throughout the entire experiment. We provided between 7 and 12 stoichiometric equivalents of electrons. These reactions were housed in an operationally simple undivided cell at room temperature. And for the electrodes, we used a material called reticulated vitreous carbon, which is just a super high surface area carbon foam. And all of these reactions were performed on commercially available ICA electrosyn devices. So here's the reaction drawn out as a scheme. We showed the generality of this reaction across 23 variations to the ring, nine substitutions to the benzylic position, and 17 variants of alkyl aldehyde. In particular, we showed compatibility with both electron-rich and electron-poor olefins, but with a substantial preference for electron-rich ones, as well as heterocyclic and carbocyclic motifs, steric bulk at the benzylic position, redox active elements like sulfur, and various therapeutics like ibuprofen. Encouraged by this remarkable compatibility, we then showed this protocol could indeed be extended to heteroaryl systems. Under slightly modified conditions, we were able to affect the dearomative functionalization of heteroarenes via their C2-C3 radical anions. We showed compatibility with 10 examples of benzofuran and benzothiophene derivatives, as well as 5 examples of various alkyl aldehydes. Again, we showed compatibility with both electron-rich and electron-poor heteroarenes. The reaction was amenable to the pharmacophoric tetrahydropyran scaffold, and it showed excellent chemoselectivity for reduction of just the C2-C3 pi bond, with no protodehalogenation observed for fluorine-containing heterocycles. Within the substrate series, we didn't observe any C3 functionalization, which was consistent with our initial hypothesis that benzylic radical stability at C3 would promote exclusive anionic reactivity at C2. In addition, we showed that commercially available precursors could be transformed in one step into biologically relevant targets.
We then showcased the utility of the reaction products by leveraging the secondary alcohol as a synthetic handle. From something as classical as a Koenig's nor glycosylation to more contemporary deoxygenated technologies developed by Macmillan and co-workers, such as this SP2-SP3 coupling or this SP3-SP3 coupling here. From this we demonstrated that a substantial amount of molecular complexity could be realized from simple commercial building blocks in just a few steps. From the beginning, we presumed that this reaction was occurring through single electron reduction of the alkene component to the corresponding radical anion, and then coupling to a neutral aldehyde species. But we acknowledged that this reaction could also proceed via an alternative mechanism, where instead the aldehyde component reduced to its ketal radical, and then this underwent a Giese addition to the alkene to give the same product. And indeed, when we ran the linear sweet voltammogram of styrene and propionaldehyde, which are just representative components in this reaction, we observed similar onset reduction potentials between the two species, meaning that the production of both species might have been thermodynamically competitive, and that therefore both mechanistic pathways were plausible. So we took to some mechanistic studies in order to elucidate which one of these pathways was dominant. In experimentally under standard conditions, we were able to reduce the olefin component in the absence of any aldehyde to the saturated alkane via the radical anion in an appreciable 61% yield. But the same kind of reaction for the aldehyde didn't yield anywhere near as much of the corresponding alcohol via the ketal radical. The same discrepancy was also observed between heteroarenes and aldehydes, albeit to a more subtle extent. Even in the presence of an electro-inactive olefin, an impractical amount of the coupled product was formed. And what this told us was that Giese addition to the olefin was actually productive, but the initial generation of that ketal radical intermediate was inefficient. Now I mentioned earlier that electron-rich olefins were more favoured over electron-poor ones. When we plotted the yield of various para-substituted aromatics as a function of their Hammett sigma parameter, what we observed was a trend that was the direct opposite to what would be expected if a ketal radical mechanism were dominant. For this, it would be expected that electron-poor olefins would be the best Giese acceptors and therefore give the highest yields, but this simply wasn't the case here. Overall, these experimental studies revealed a substantial discrepancy in the efficiency of reduction between the two components. We already observed from the linear sweet voltammetry that the reductions of both components were thermodynamically competitive, and so we needed to provide an alternative explanation to explain this observed discrepancy, and for that we turned to more in-depth voltammetric studies. So here's the same linear sweet voltammogram that I showed earlier of styrene and propionaldehyde, and upon face value these two traces may be considered somewhat similar. But what we became really interested in was the rate of reduction, and so we replotted these as their respective first derivatives, and now these two traces appeared profoundly different in two key areas. Early on, it could be argued that the aldehyde component showed an earlier onset reduction potential, implying that its reduction is slightly thermodynamically favourable. But in the over potential region, we observed the alkene showed a much greater current response, and again, this same trend was observed in heterocycles. And since these reactions were run at deep applied potentials to access these intermediates, we suggested that there might be a kinetic bias toward olefin reduction over aldehyde reduction. It's not to say that either pathway is unproductive, but more that the generation of the olefinic radical anion simply occurred at a much faster rate and therefore constituted the pathway that dominated this reaction. We then provided further evidence for this using square wave voltammetry, which operates at a much faster time scale than linear sweep does. And at that faster time scale, we could actually observe two peaks for styrene, which we could ascribe to the first reduction to the radical anion and the second reduction to the dianion. Now this was really encouraging, as in square wave, split peaks often imply fast electron transfer kinetics. And at that same time scale, we didn't observe even a single peak for propionaldehyde, highlighting this discrepancy in the electron transfer kinetics between the two components. Now what was really interesting was when we added increasing amounts of propionaldehyde to that styrene mixture, what happened was the current ratio between the two peaks reversed, 
And what we thought was going on here was that propion aldehyde was intercepting the styrene radical anion and disturbing that hypersensitive equilibrium between the two species. This was quite nice as it gave us a little window into what might be going on mechanistically in this reaction. Now this whole reaction design was contingent upon the use of rapid alternating polarity and to ensure its necessity we investigated the effect of that polarity switch duration on the reaction outcome. As we lengthened that switch duration longer and longer towards an infinitesimal amount which would be direct current or DC, we observed a complete reversal in the reaction profile from coupling to saturative overreduction. And this provided evidence to suggest that longer pulse durations afforded enough time for overreduction and protonation of the alkene via that dianion intermediate, while short frequencies suppressed this and permitted coupling. Now, electronically, these radical anion intermediates are delocalized through the pi system, but experimentally they react as dystonic-like species, with discrete radical and discrete anionic reactivity at two different carbons. And so there were two possible manifolds of reactivity to engage the aldehyde, either polar or radical. And to differentiate between these two, we subjected this radical clock here to the reaction conditions in the presence of propion aldehyde. And what we observed was that the cyclopropane motif completely opened up, exclusively affording this ring-opened homoallylic alcohol. And since ring opening could only have occurred through a benzylic radical, we deduced that addition to the aldehyde was most likely anionic in nature. We could then probe the fate of that benzylic radical, and through deuterium labelling studies, suggest that it was indeed being reduced further to the benzylic anion, and then being protonated, or in this case, deuterated. So in conclusion, we've developed an intermolecular coupling reaction between vinyl arenes or heteroarenes and alkyl aldehydes, which uses rapid alternating polarity electrolysis as the linchpin to controllably access the radical anion intermediates generated from these olefins and direct their reactivity towards a nucleophilic addition to alkyl aldehydes. This approach is catalyst and metal free and occurs at room temperature in an operationally simple undivided cell and we showcase the generality of this approach across 57 examples. And with that I'd like to thank my supervisor Associate Professor Anastasios Poilizos for allowing me to work on this project. Thanks to Dr Milenicis for all of her guidance and support on this project and throughout my PhD. Thanks to Taylor Wilson who did a massive job in spearheading all of the heterocycle work on this project. And finally, I'd like to thank Matthew again for this wonderful opportunity to present on Synthesis Workshop. Thanks for watching this episode and if you've got any questions at all or want to reach out, I'd love to connect on LinkedIn. Thank you, Liam, for sharing your work in the Spotlight episode. To dive deeper into this fascinating chemistry, check out Liam's recent publication in JAX. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our podcast, please be sure to subscribe here on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Synthesis Workshop. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.